good afternoon um good morning um depending on, on wherever you are uh this is killian banda from afap um we will we will start at uh, 10 minutes past two um or 10 minutes past 12 uh, gmt thank you very much for uh, joining our webinar Okay, good afternoon, good morning once again, depending on wherever you are. Um, uh, our webinar is starting now. Thank you very much uh, for finding time uh, from your busy schedules. Um, over to you, Dr. Wanzala. <clears throat> Thank you, Chilean. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us, coming to participate in this webinar and welcome. Uh, the title of the webinar is COVID-19 and Fertilizer Value Chains in Sub-Saharan Africa, Impacts and Policy Responses. My name is Maria Wanzala and I work for AFAP, the African Fertilizer and Agribusiness Partnership. This webinar is brought to you by PEMEFA, which is the Partnership for Enabling Market Environments for Fertilizer in Africa. PEMEFA is a consortium of five organizations, AFAP, IFDC, which is the International Fertilizer and De De Development Center, Michigan State University, New Markets Lab, and RENAPRI, which is the regional 
um, Agricultural Policy Research Institute. Tamaka was formed in 2018 in response to the fertilizer crisis facing Africa, which we are all familiar with. In a nutshell, agriculture is the main economic sector in the majority of African countries. But although fertilizers are critical to increase agricultural productivity, fertilizer use in sub-Saharan Africa is only 15 kilograms per hectare, compared to the world average of 124 kilograms per hectare. Now, a key reason is the weak fertilizer markets in sub-Saharan Africa that are still largely unable to deliver quality and appropriate fertilizers to our farmers at affordable prices and in a timely manner. And one of the main reasons for the weak fertilizer market is the lack of a conducive enabling environment for the private sector. In many African countries, there's a little knowledge and understanding among policymakers and other stakeholders of how the regulatory systems that govern the supply, distribution and use of fertilizers impact on the performance of the sector and on the private sector in particular. So PEMEFA was formed in July of 2017 with seed funding from Michigan State University's Alliance for African Partnerships. And the goal of PEMEFA is to transform African agriculture and livelihoods by improving smallholder farmers' access to and use of fertilizers by establishing national and regional fertilizer policies and regulatory frameworks that will facilitate increased private sector investment and participation in fertilizer value chains. So the consortium then has three objectives. The first is to generate evidence to mobilize support for policy and regulatory reforms that will encourage private sector led fertilizer markets and improve smallholder farmers access to and profitable use of fertilizers. The second key objective is to build the capacity of stakeholders along the fertilizer value chains to establish a conducive enabling environment for private sector led fertilizer markets. And the third objective is to, to drive ongoing efforts to reform policy, legal and regulatory reforms for fertilizers through outreach and engagement. So some of our key activities to date are as follows. We produce a synthesis report on best practices for regulations, policies and legal frameworks to create an enabling environment for, for private sector led investment in fertilizer value chains in sub-Saharan Africa. We also had four lecture series in uh, uh, both American and um, so African universities on fertilizer policy and regulatory issues. We also contributed to a study on the impact of the 2012 Economic Community of West African Fertilizers uh, regulatory framework on fertilizer trade and use. And then we also conducted a literature review on best practices for public-private dialogues and took stock of current fertilizer PPDs in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, as part of our continued efforts to disseminate PMF's research and engage with stakeholders on the importance of designing policy and regulatory systems that encourage the private sector-led supply and distribution of high-quality fertilizers to our farmers in order to increase agricultural productivity, we have decided to take our message online and hold two webinars, one for East and Southern Africa and one for West Africa. The objectives of the webinars are as follows. Number one is to raise awareness of the impact of COVID-19 on the fertilizer industry and fertilizer value chains in sub-Saharan Africa. And the second objective is to share policy responses that have been successful in a, a, a number of countries, both in, both in East and Southern Africa and in West Africa. So the PEMEFA consortium is then drawing on its vast network to identify policy makers from several countries to present and share their experiences during these webinars. Today's webinar covers East and Southern Africa. It is comprised of one keynote presentation and four panelists. We are very excited about the caliber of our presenters and our panelists, and we are looking forward to an interesting, interactive and informative session. Again, thank you very, very much for joining us. And without further ado, I would like us to begin. Um, let me just say a quick um, housekeeping word about our Q&A protocols. So we'll have our keynote presentation, and then we will have a 10 to 15 minute um, keynote uh, Q&A session. And then we will have our four panelist presentations, and then we'll have another Q&A session after we've, had the, we've heard from our four panelists. And then during that Q&A session, we ask you to please type in your, your, um, your questions in the Q&A section of, the, of, the, of, your, um, of your Zoom. And then uh, and indicate who the question is being directed to. 
And then during the Q&A se section, we will pick up those questions and post them to our panelists. Okay, so without further ado, I would now like to introduce our first panelist. Our first panelist is Dr. Joseph Rusike. I think we'll be pulling up his presentation. He is a well-accomplished agricultural economist from Zimbabwe who has vast experience in agricultural policy and development. His experience is drawn from working with leading development agencies across Africa, which includes the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, the International Crops Research Institute for the Semi-Arid Tropics, as well as the University of Zimbabwe. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Rusike. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Can you, th thank you, Maria. Can you see my presentation? Yes, we Hello. can. Um, I think it's the second page. I'm not sure if it's, if it's the first page, but we can see it. Okay. Yes. Yeah, we can see it. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And um, what we I'll try and do in the next 20 minutes is to provide an overview of how COVID is affected 11 countries in Africa and how they have responded, particularly with fertilizer specific policies, how that is then impacting fertilizer value chains and particularly agro, agro dealers and um, rural dealers in those particular countries. Um, first, let's look at a um, conceptual framework for how we may think about assessing the impact of COVID um, on fertilizer value chains. We have, starting, I'm reading here from my left, we have the macro environmental factors, and this is the politics, economic factors, technological factors, and then the shocks, the shocks is, that are hitting the economies, and one of them is COVID, we've got climate change, and armyworm, for example, locusts, and um, these then shape the national development goals of the different governments that they're pursuing. Invariably, almost every government that we look at um, has um, Vision 2030, which is to lift um, the, the living standards in the countries so that they become middle income country in the next 20, 30 years. But these are translated into policies and plans. And, um, and in this particular case, we will see that when COVID started, almost every country responded by a COVID response plan. We want to understand what are the elements of that plan. And then we want to understand how those are being implemented through policy instruments and the ministries, um, the institutions that are doing the implementation, these are the Sorry, ministries. Joseph. Yes. Um, can you uh, <clears throat> increase your volume a little bit or get close to your mic? Um, people are hardly okay. um, here. Yeah, thank you. Oh, is this any better? I think so. Yeah. Just get close okay. to your mic. Yeah. So can I continue? Yes. Sorry about that. Uh, then we, the policy instruments invariably will see that uh, the levers will include physical policies, monetary, trade. These are the instruments that governments used and, 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 and as well as um, agriculture input output and fertilizer industry specific um, policies. These then affect the fertilizer value chains and the data that we will be looking at We'll be looking at what is happening at the port, um, transportation, what is happening at the border, access, availability, and fertilizer prices. Then this then affects uh, the farm households. So let's start running through the countries and with their responses. We start with Burundi. When COVID hit, um, they formulated a response plan and an operational plan. Um, among the physical measures they um, started to implement as part of that plan, they reprioritized the budget to the hardest existing areas 
and um, taxes were forgiven, particularly in those industries, and then subsidies to pay for workers. Monetary um, policies included a, a, a loan extension of loans and um, reducing bank fees, and um, borders were closed in terms of trade. And then more specifically to do with fertilizers, they continued with their national fertilizer program, although there was a delay in 2020 in the procurement of fertilizers. However, this is not expected to affect consumption. Ethiopia, similarly, we run through um, a response plan. Uh, there is budgetary um, fiscal um, policies that they are implemented. Recall COVID has got both health and economic consequences and the physical is being rolled out particularly to deal with health, to make sure you've got enough money for the health um, while we are dealing with tax amnesties um, on, on, on the other affected areas of the economy. The central bank um, injected liquidity in the system as a, as, as a stimulus and um, borders were closed except for cargo traffic. And then we have, um, in terms of fertilizers, the tender for the supply of um, NP fertilizers in urea um, has been done for this year. Um, supply systems were reorganized to comply with safety procedures, limit the number of distribution points, make sure these safety procedures, including distances when you are distributing fertilizers, and more, all payments are being done using mobile money. Kenya similarly uh, was pursuing in agricultural sector transformation and growth strategy. It set up a war room and the war room is transiting to an agricultural transformation office. We get budget um, um, interventions, uh, monetary interventions, and then particularly with respect to the fertilizer industry, this government supported to enhance farmers' access to agricultural inputs using the OE voter subsidy. Yara donated some fertilizers. One acre fund um, is also intervening. And more significantly uh, the, for the case of Kenya, the Kenya Tea Development Authority um, canceled its 2020 tenders. And this is affected um, COVID hitting the uh, supply sources in, 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 in the other countries. We turn to Malawi. Malawi, again, we see the pattern of a response plan, more or less the budget interventions, expenditures, uh, especially on health programs, tax waivers on imports of essential goods and emergency cash transfers, monetary policies, which are designed to increase liquidity in the system and um, restructure loans, trade of essential goods um, happening at borders. And um, in this particular case, um, they were delays because of the screening procedures. And then in the area of fertilizers, the government is implementing its affordable input program to provide subsidized seed and fertilizers. A FAO a, a, a intervened as well, and Yara donated fertilizers. Mozambique response plan, and after that, we have the physical um, interventions similar to the other countries, monetary interventions, especially to reduce the discount rate and to increase liquidity in the system. Link borders were not closed. And then the, although the government is not implementing a fertilizer subsidy in Mozambique, the government is implementing a credit line for agriculture at subsidized interest rates, 0% for smallholders and 5% um, for commercial farmers. FAO is implementing or piloting an e-voucher program in the case of Mozambique. Yara donated fertilizers. Rwanda, um, Intervention, policy, response, um, plan, budget, budget. Sorry about that. Uh, 
um, Rwanda, then we have the um, we have the central bank uh, reducing policy rate, uh, like in other countries, and to and 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 and, and allowing banks and and and, and microfinancial institutions to restructure loans. Um, land borders are closed except for cargo traffic. And then the Minister of Agriculture is implementing a smart program, subsidy program. Um, and the Wanda Fertilizer Company is supporting farmers by facilitating them to access a DAP fertilizers. I turn to South Africa. Um, and South Africa took a slightly different path in that instead of working out a policy response plan, it declared a national disaster under the Disaster Management Act. And it then moved to a, then formulate social and economic support packages and then an economic strategy. With respect to physical and monetary interventions, more or less like the other countries, trade um, um, the borders were closed and then reopened later on. More specifically, with respect to fertilizers, the were breakdowns at Fosco, and um, and also the plant was uh, had some uh, COVID infections, as a result of which it didn't function. The Russians and um, have been able to supply um, fertilizers, a uh, mono ammonium phosphates, into the country to. Uh, to ameliorate the gap. Tanzania, Tanzania again, it took a slightly different path in that an agricultural advisory committee consisting of public and private officials prepared a shock recovery proposals for agriculture. The budget effects uh, were more or less the same um, and the central bank interventions, the Bank of Tanzania, intervened like in other countries to increase liquidity and um, um, reduce um, or allow um, for, for credit um, readjustments. Um, land border was not closed. And then specifically turning to fertilizer industry, the Tanzanian Fertilizer Regulatory Authority, the bulk purchase scheme is um, being implemented, one acre fund is implementing some interventions, and Yara um, did distribute some NPKs targeting the vulnerable households. Uganda will hear a lot more. Um, they put in place a national response plan for agriculture and did the budget inter interventions as we have seen in other countries. Monetary interventions similar to other countries, and then the government is implementing an e-voucher subsidy program. Um, Yara has donated some fertilizers and a BI development trust is also um, doing some fertilizer interventions. Zambia uh, moved to do a response plan. Uh, there was a budgetary um, interventions um, to finance COVID uh, expense, health expenses. Monetary, we see the government, um, the central bank intervening by reducing the discount rate and um, increasing or providing liquidity in the system. The land border not closed, but mandatory quarantine requirement for drivers. And the government is implementing its farm input support program. AFA and, uh, uh, and Af African Green Resources have some interventions and one acre funds is also supporting some interventions. Zimbabwe, again, moved to do a national preparedness and response plan. Government intervened with a budget, um, budget interventions. And um, the central bank, like in other countries, uh, intervened to, in, uh, to reduce the discount rate and increase liquidity in the system. Zimbabwe is interesting because at this stage, it introduced the multi-currency system, replacing the use of the Zim dollar that it had uh, adopted. 
than before, and the land border not closed, and the government is implementing a fertilizer subsidy program. Now let's turn to what the impacts of particularly these macroeconomic um, um, interventions have been on the fertilizer value chains. Again, running through the countries, um, in the case of Burundi, the imports will be affected by what's happening in Dar es Salaam and Mombasa, which will tend to shortly uh, transport to normal operations, um, access availability, um, normal trading, um, although the delays in procurement, but these are not expected to have an uh, impact on, 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 on fertilizer supply. Ethiopia obtains its imports through Djibouti. They were normal operations, although there were delays in the movement um, of, of, of fertilizers due to late arrival of fertilizer bags from India. Um, transport, normal operations, although there were delays with loading and um, um, among truck drivers affected terminally transportation of fertilizers from port to central stores. Um, access distribution through the voter system, limited restrictions on public gatherings, uh, and some central stores were closed and private owners were refusing to rent out additional storage uh, spaces. And the result is we're getting a slight increase in prices, mainly driven by increase in transport and storage costs. For Kenya, the normal operations at Port of Mombasa continued and in the face of COVID. Normal operations movement of local and transit vehicles during non curfew hours um, and, and, and normal trading, although there was a shortage of single superphosphate. And we'll see that prices initially decreased, but micro level data is going to show us more about um, this um, um, a general a big picture assessments that we're looking at right now. Um, let's turn to Malawi. A imports, most of the imports will be coming through Baira. So we'll see what's happening at Baira. Um, normal operations, uh, there were slight delays at border crossings in terms of transport. Access availability, normal trading, retail shops, trading in compliance with regulations and um, average prices, um, we can see that they are slightly, they started off and they were slightly increasing, but we'll come back to this with in much more detail um, in, 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 a, in, in a few slides below. Mozambique, normal operations at the port uh, with restrictions in place on unloading loose bags and um, um, restrictions in working hours, increased congestion and demerit range. Um, and then movement of goods by accredited operators was permitted um, and, and normal operations at border crossings. Retail shops are op operating in the normal way, no expected shortages. Rwanda imports through Mombasa in Dar es Salaam we have already seen that Mombasa was working in normally, um, normal operations in terms of transport and um, normal trading. South Africa, normal operations, uh, transport, border, transit, normal operations, although there were slight delays at border crossings due to screening, access availability, uh, off-season, when the data were being collected and therefore it was a limited trading. Tanzania uh, at the port, normal operations, although in the case of Tanzania, they started to encourage a demurrage or to increase the demurrage free uh, period, which made uh, the port more competitive than Mombasa. Um, normal operations to do with transport and normal operations for trading. Uganda, the import through Mombasa, we've already seen what was happening at Mombasa. Mombasa was operating normally um, and transport, uh, normal operations. 
normal trading and um, slight increase in price. And then Zambia, it imposed through Baira in Dar es Salaam. We have already seen what's happening at Baira. Uh, sorry, it, yep, it bought Baira in Dar es Salaam. Normal operations, internally normal operations, no expected shortages. Zimbabwe importing through Baira and Deben. Um, and again, uh, movement of goods were allowed and normal trading uh, is subject to social safety measures and um, prices during this time when this big picture data were being collected, we are normal. Now, let me now turn to another piece of evidence of what COVID is impacting. And these, the, the, the analysis we will now begin to see is based on a survey of 240 um, dealers, hub agro dealers and dealers that are in seven countries. And the countries are Kenya, Malawi, Mozambique, Tanzania, Uganda, Ghana, Zambia, and Nigeria, working out to about 30 to 40 responses per country. And when you ask what inputs and services were you providing, and we are running those, this question was um, administered in July, August, and September. And we are showing the pattern for August and September. And basically, the responses across all the um, eight countries were seed almost 100%. Uh, uh, all the agro dealers and uh, the respondents were doing seeds, 100% were also doing fertilizers, almost 100% were doing crop protection chemicals. Then you start getting changes in extension, um, those are dealing farm equipment and mechanization. Last of products, they were virtually all in Tanzania. Why are we interested in this? Because the diversity uh, of a business, how it is diversified its business portfolio might help it survive if it's hit by COVID effects at the local level. But we see the same pattern, it changes slightly when uh, you, uh, uh, for the month of September, where we begin to see some more movement into mechanization and equipment, and that's mostly Nigeria and Uganda that are contributing to that. We turn and the respondents were asked, so what has been the negative impact on your business operations? And we have this data, um, the responses cover the premises were closed, sales were reduced, uh, customers were reduced, I was unable to pay bills, rent, wages, um, um, electricity, and so forth. And the responses are for July, August, and September. One thing which hits us is that the, there was impact, and the impact is mostly on reducing sales, reducing customers, and um, it increases over time from July, August, and September. And this is uniform across all countries, more or less. If we turn to the next set of questions, which then asks, what was the impact on the operation of your business? And here, we are mostly interested in, did you lay off employee? Did you have reduced access to trade credit? What about fluctuations in inflation and interest rates? How did they affect you? And if there were increased transport costs, how did that affect you? And again, um, a, 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 a laying out those data for the countries um, for July, August, and September, we begin to see that um, there are some effects, especially increased transportation uh, in Nigeria and in Mozambique. Some of the countries where uh, farmers, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it, some farmers are in far fun and you have to cover a lot of distance to reach farmers. Um, but again, there is a pattern that these, the negative hits increase over, over, over time. Okay. So, 
Hi, Dr. Sik. I think yes. um, you, you need to wrap up. Um, okay. Yeah, just one more slide. Yeah. Um, this slide shows us what's happening with fertilizer prices. And the what we see happening is that um, if we ask for the different products and the price rise, the, the percent increase in price in, that, in a particular month, uh, it tends to increase as we move from July, August, September, especially for urea. And this is worse in certain countries and the most countries affected include Nigeria, Uganda, and Zambia. And, and we'll come back to reason. So to summarize and um, draw some of the implications, we have governments um, responding in more or less um, using similar tools, a plan, a physical package, and monetary policies, trade and fertilizer specific policies. Big picture assessments would suggest that the effects have been minimal. Operations have continued as normal. But when we look at micro level data, we start to see that there's some real impact on especially um, negatively. And um, um, as we are collecting more data and um, we can be able to do deeper analysis to really show us uh, what these effects are, we really think that this has got to be combined with political economy analysis of how governments are then intervening um, um, in these markets. And there's a need for support studies of government responses and specific issues as they arise, particularly using a machine learning and artificial intelligence type of tools. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Dr. Marusike. Um, in the interest of time, uh, I think uh, uh, people are encouraged to drop their question in the Q&A um, chat box. Uh, we can go straight into um, country presentations because I think my time is already uh, gone. Um, over to you, Dr. Wanzana. Julian, can we not, there is one question. I think it would be good to take this one question for Joseph. Oh, okay. Um, All right. There is one question that has been posted there. Um, it reads, uh, Dr. Sike, if I understand well, um, there has not been a shift in fertilizer uh, or input policies in direct uh, response to COVID-19. It appears that there has been a continuation of existing subsidies and other programs. Is this correct? Um, can one then conclude that fertilizer subsidies were affected um, were affected by fiscal monetary trade policies, bearing in mind that COVID uh, hit most parts of Southern Africa after the main summer um, production season? Uh, it's coming from Tinashe Kapuya. Um, yeah, the I think the answer to that question will be is 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 is, is the data showing uh, the effects of COVID are still working their way through the economies, and um, the government uh, continued with the programs that they were already implementing. Um, but you can see some new interventions uh, by One Acre Fund, by Yara, for example, which are directly in response to COVID, which overlay what the governments were already doing. Now, as we see the impact of COVID, of COVID on, and in this, we didn't analyze the impact on blenders, fertilizer importers, fertilizer manufacturers. We are focusing on hub agro dealers and dealers, and the evidence is that COVID, the negative impacts increase over time. And we 
I hypothesize that we will see government now formulating fertilizer specific policies to deal particularly with those issues as, as they arise. But recall what happens in the Ministry of Finance affects the rural sector more than what happens in the Ministry of Agriculture. So the first reaction, because the powerful tool you have out there as a government is physical policy, monetary policy, and that's what they were using. And is over time, you can expect them to then do agricultural specific and fertilizer specific policies. Thank you. Um, I think some of some of these questions can be taken um, offline, and um, uh, we can follow up uh, uh, through emails and and so forth. Uh, over to you, Dr. Wanzala. Um, Thank you very much, Dr. Rusike, for that very detailed and informative presentation. Thank you. I think we can now uh, begin uh, the four presentations from our four panelists. We'll begin with the first panelist. If we can pull up her presentation, please. Ms. Josephine Nakanwagi. Um, can I, Joseph, can you stop sharing your, sc your screen? I'm not so sure. Um, Dr. Mkum Makumba, are you there? Yes, am I here? Okay, let me show you. Uh, let that when I was logging in, I've been put actually on the wrong name. Ah, okay, I see. I see I'm now. Wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so, so let me let me let me put put your your presentation, or you can do after the Ugandan one. They've already put no their. Thank you very much, Doc. Yeah. Over to you, Dr. Wanzel. Thank you. Thank you very much. So our next presentation is by Ms. Josephine Nakanwagi. She's the Zonal Sustainable Land Management Coordinator and Cluster Coordinator on the Agriculture Cluster Development Project, or ACDP, under MAIF, which is the Ministry of Agriculture, Animal Industry, and Fisheries in Uganda. Ms. Nakanwagi has built vast experience in integrated soil fertility and land management over the years, and she has served in different regions of Uganda with different public and private partners. So now I'm happy to hand over to Ms. Nakanwagi. Well, um, thank you so much. Uh, my name has already been uh, introduced to uh, the rest of the participants in this uh, uh, meeting. I'm going to make a presentation from my experience under the Agriculture Cluster Development Project. And uh, just to say that this project is handling many commodities, and one of them is fertilizer, but we also have seed, we have post-harvest handling materials, and then the chemicals for the farmers. I just, so, uh, are hello, you hearing? Hello, hello yes? Justine, can, can you put yes? um, a slide show, please? Can I do what? Can, I, can you put your slides on a slideshow? Oh, yes. Sure. Just on top there? Uh, yeah. Okay. So um, in my introduction, uh, the Agriculture Cluster Development Project was developed as a result of uh, constraints in the agricultural value chain, including the poor quality inputs. Uh, one of them is the fertilizers, the limited access to the fertilizers, then the low soil fertility, and the weak uh, market linkages, among others. And SEDP, uh, to address these uh, challenges, we look at five commodities. That is rice, maize, cassava beans, and, and coffee. And we are using the cluster approach to implement activities, whereby cluster approach means we have three to seven districts uh, grouped together, and they are able to handle uh, at least two of the commodities, that two of the five commodities that are being handled by the project. So through the Agriculture Cluster Development Project, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture is availing fertilizers to farmers, and our target is 450,000 farmers 
using the subsidy e-voucher arrangement. And our e-voucher management agency is UBA, United Bank of Africa. So under that arrangement, we support a farmer on one acre of land through three seasons. And in the first season, he uh, co-funds at 33%. That is for the farmer. Then the government, it is 67%. Then the second season, the farmer co-funds at 50%. Then the government also at 50%. Then the third season, the farmer gives uh, 67% and the government contributes 33%. And uh, that uh, percentage is calculated uh, of 450. Now, 450 is the total cost of, of the inputs per season. So that percentage is 33% of 450. And that is the amount for, for, for the farmer to co-fund. And uh, for our package, like I said, we have seed, we have fertilizer, we have chemicals, we have taplings, we have pick bags and other tools, especially for the coffee farmers that they need, like in terms of pruning their coffee uh, trees. So farmers with capacity co-fund and they, they are enrolled into the e-voucher system. Then also agro-input dealers through a call, they express interest and then they are assessed and accredited and then also enrolled into the e-voucher system. And uh, the accreditation is done uh, by my if Department of Inspection and Certification plus uh, other team members from the project. Then uh, the process of uh, uh, this e-voucher system includes enrollment and enrollment is for the farmers and the agro input dealers then ordering of inputs this is done by the farmers after being enrolled into the e-voucher system then uh, the agro input dealers go into the system and see the orders from the farmers and they are able to deliver and then the distribution of inputs and then finally redemption so uh, delivering is done by the agro input dealers and also redemption is done by the agro input dealers with the support from the farmers because the farmers after enrollment, they get a password which they give to the agro input dealers after they have delivered the inputs. So access to fertilizers, uh, this is free. A farmer is free to take uh, any type of fertilizer of their choice for as long as it's available with any agro input dealer under the subsidy arrangement. So this program offers both the straight, straight fertilizers and then the blended, uh, crop specific blended fertilizers. And I've tried to give uh, some of the fertilizer ratios for NPK that we are using in this, uh, in this project in my presentation. Uh, so uh, as of now, over 180,000 farmers have accessed fertilizers and other inputs to the Evocha system. And I've given some details also. So for the fertilizers, we have so far 136,861 uh, bags, 50 kilogram bags of fertilizers have been accessed by farmers. And since uh, we, 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 in the system, usually a farmer is free to take at least uh, a minimum of at least one bag, but you, they can also take two and some even take three. So it's not, it's not easy for us to know how many farmers looking at the number of bags because some take two, others take three, and others take one. Then when you go to bean seed, we have 876,000. 43 kilograms of bean seed. And for bean seed, we are giving a farmer 30 kilograms to plant one acre. So when you get 30 and divide it by the kilograms of bean, you get 29,201 farmers that have accessed bean seed. Then maize seed, uh, 327,972 kilograms. And we are also giving 10 kilograms to plant one acre. And when we divide 10 by 327,972, you get 32, uh, 797 farmers. Then rice seed, we have 26,231 kilograms. And we are giving on average 20 kilograms per, per, per farmer to plant one acre. Though in other areas it varies whether he's doing upland or lowland rice. So with the rice, we have 1,461 farmers. Then cassava cuttings, 
we have uh, 17,221 bags, but for cassava, we are giving eight bags for one acre, and that is uh, 2,152 2, farmers that have uh, accessed cassava cuttings through this arrangement. So here I have some uh, pictures still. Uh, fertilizers have been delivered in different districts depending on the choice that the farmers have made and with guidance from the extension staff who inform farmers of what is needed for, for their uh, uh, crop specific uh, production. So this is uh, a picture. This is DAP that has been delivered in one of the districts uh, called Butebo district. Then uh, here, still the distribution of inputs. Now the distribution of inputs because of the COVID uh, uh, restriction. We have standard operating procedures that were issued through the Ministry of Health that we follow. Very many farmers cannot crowd to get their inputs as was before. They have to come in in a few numbers and they get their input. So on the left, still these farmers are receiving their fertilizer bags and that is uh, still up. Then on the right, the gentleman a red shirt is an agricultural officer and he's there to support the farmer because at the point of a farmer picking the input, redemption also must take place and we ensure that the, the agro input dealer has been paid, but also the farmer has received the rightful inputs as uh, requested for. So the distributions are done in smaller numbers at a time. The impacts of COVID on fertilizer value chain, some farmers, uh, failed to access the e-voucher services to enroll because of restriction in movement of our e-voucher management agency staff who could not move during that time when there were restrictions. Then delayed delivery of fertilizers to farmers and other inputs by the agro-input dealers. Then weak market linkages were accelerated due to restricted movement. While farmers could uh, uh, have their linkages during COVID, they could not move and the transportation of some of their produce was affected. Then also reduced income flows and reinvestment in agriculture production. And here what I mean, some farmers always wait to sell what they have produced before they can buy inputs for the next season. So unless they sell, sometimes they're, they're not having enough money to buy inputs for the next season. So this was also affected because some farmers could not sell what they had produced the previous season. Uh, then uh, looking at the agro input dealers, uh, part of our value chain, some of them lack, lacked enough stock to supply to farmers, still due to restricted movement, then failure to get to the agro inputs in Okay, to get agro inputs imported in the country on time, then partial deliveries of inputs to farmers, then lack of local distribution networks. Most of them were doing truck distributions or having one stop, which uh, was limiting access to those inputs in time because farmers had to, that means farmers had to move long distances to come and pick their inputs from one point. Then some agro input dealers also lost the stability of their fertilizers in some clusters and districts because uh, here some of them were giving out and not redeeming on spot. And then they had to go back and redeem later after the farmer had taken the, what, the fertilizer. So in that scenario, you find they, they bring their inputs and maybe leave them with the agriculture officer. He gives them out, but he's not able to provide proper information of who took the fertilizer and then the redemption was not done. So that's one of the, 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 the impact for, for the agro-input dealer. Then uh, what has government done about uh, the impacts of COVID? Uh, movement of vehicles and trucks to deliver inputs was allowed following the standard operating procedures uh, preventing the, the spread of the pandemic. Then the established extension system, which supports distribution of inputs, both at the district and sub-county level, they allowed the agricultural officers to still operate and move so that they can support uh, the distribution and access to inputs in time. Then precision inspection and certification, this uh, was still allowed and done. 
to ensure uh, quality control of inputs. Then still government uh, is running this subsidy agro input program. This program was there before the pandemic, but the coming of the pandemic uh, still uh, helped to raise awareness to the farmers because while there were very many other ways farmers would get inputs, but this was one of the programs that still was able to move in the communities and sensitize and inform farmers on ways they can improve their productivity through uh, joining this uh, subsidy program. Then agro input dealers have been advised to establish local distribution networks in different districts to enhance redemption and traceability of distributed inputs. Um, then uh, still, in some cases, uh, they allowed manual redemption to enable farmers get inputs on time. That means they would just take record that this farmer took the fertilizer and seed, and then later they go back and uh, redeem redeem the money from the farmer's account, though that was not encouraged. Then the supply of food to some people who are highly exposed to hunger due to COVID-19. So uh, down here, these are, this is a newspaper extract when they were uh, instructing the extension workers to go back and serve uh, the farmers, because if we didn't do that, that would mean shortage of food in the near future. So this allowed us to continue with the uh, production with the farmers. And I, I want to thank you all for listening to me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, um, Ms. Josephine. Um, I'm running, I'm the timekeeper here. I think I'm running behind with 15 minutes or so. I will be... Uh, sharing my screen for the Malau presentation. Uh, Josephine, can you uh, stop sharing your screen? Thank you, Killian. Thank you very much, Josephine, for that very informative presentation. You gave us a very clear picture of the subsidy program in Uganda and how the government's COVID response is affecting um, fertilizer use. Thank you very much. Let's now move on to the next presentation. Um, I think Killian is preparing it. Let's just give him a few minutes to pull up the presentation on the screen. The presenter is Dr. Wilkson Makumba from Malawi, and he's the Director of Agricultural Research Services in the Ministry of Agriculture in Malawi. Thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Makumba. Just give us a few minutes, please, to pull up your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Kian. Uh, Morrison Makumba, as actually uh, the introduction has been made already, uh, be presenting actually on behalf of Malawi, uh, the scenario on the COVID. As a matter of introduction, actually uh, Malawi's economy is agro-based, uh, where agriculture is uh, contributing to over 30% of the GDP and also contributes to over 60% of the export earnings and uh, employs over 80% of the rural population, at least uh, to facilitate on their livelihood. Uh, the coming of the COVID actually indeed has uh, negatively impacted on agriculture sector uh, due to the restriction of movements and also closing of the borders. Uh, restriction of the movements actually uh, indeed impeded farmers in access of the market. Although uh, there was actually, uh, there was not 100% of the closure of the market, but it's still uh, uh, people were not really going into the open markets to buy uh, the uh, uh, the co agricultural commodities, as such, the farmers actually really suffered. They could not uh, sell all their uh, agricultural commodities as they were expected. And also, we have seen actually the importation of uh, fertilizers has been slowed down. 
uh, simply because of the closure of the uh, and the borders. As such, as of today, uh, when the fertilizer is supposed to be distributed into the selling points in the rural areas, uh, we still find that uh, uh, there's a lot of fertilizer that is still on the way in the seas. Next slide, please. Uh, however, the government indeed has actually uh, come in with a, quite a number of intervention, uh, trying actually uh, to reduce the impact of the uh, uh, the COVID-19. Of course, the, the first the actual the first that the government intervention that the government did is to reduce the price, uh, the pump price of the fuel, uh, so that uh, the transport costs should not be higher because most of the commodities uh, affect, their prices are affected by the prices. Uh, and more importantly, uh, the implementation of the affordable inputs program. This is a subsidy program uh, where each family uh, household is, uh, is getting uh, two bags of 50 kg uh, by weight of fertilizer. This is NPK and the urea. Uh, and they will be buying at the almost the uh, uh, 5,000 kwacha, but the actual price is 4,495 uh, kwacha. Uh, they are also uh, actually uh, on that part, there's a, a package of seed. So the farmer is able to choose uh, either to buy uh, maize seed. And on maize seed, of course, there's a hybrid seed or OPV seed. So the farmer has got a choice. And depending on the area where the farmer is, uh, could choose to buy actually sorghum or rice. Uh, and it, all that is all, all actually is offered at a subsidized uh, price. So under the affordable input program, the government indeed is using the, uh, the a voucher where the farmers will be able to redeem their uh, farm inputs uh, but through the use of their national identity cards. Uh, this program is targeting uh, uh, 4.279 million uh, farming families, those that will be getting actually those inputs. And we're expecting actually uh, to uh, actually dispute over 427,910 uh, metric tons. Uh, provision of the PPEs has been done by the government, especially to extension, knowing that uh, it is important that uh, uh, the uh, farmers should still access extension services. Uh, the, with the restriction of movements, actually, it was really not possible for our extension officers uh, to go and assist the farmers uh, with the extension services to provide the extension services. So with the provision of the PVs, at least it's serving the extension uh, uh, officers, at least to reach the farmers and assist them. Uh, next slide. Uh, also the private sector is coming also in large numbers to assist the, actually uh, the government uh, in the, actually mitigating the impact of COVID in uh, agriculture. Uh, and lately, we've seen the Yara Action Africa uh, program, uh, which they call Thriving Farm, Thriving Africa, uh, where a donation of 5,000 uh, metric tons NPK fertilizer has been made actually to the uh, farmers. Uh, at least each family actually uh, received the uh, 150 kg bag of NPK fertilizer. And the distribution of this, of course, has been done by the private sector. And the, um, happy actually to not, and indeed, uh, to not that the, uh, to, uh, to mention that the EFA uh, successfully led actually the distribution of this fertilizer, which as of now, I think they should be at least completing uh, the last uh, actually batches of the fertilizer uh, to the farmers. Also, they came in a large way. Uh, to assist the farmers in their program of smallholder, uh, better farms, better lives, uh, with the uh, 100 metric tons of hybrid maize seed. This package actually goes well with the fertilizer that the Yara has actually uh, distributed to the farmers under the Action Africa program. 
uh, there are quite a number of NGOs uh, and also donors and individuals that have actually come in to donate the PPEs uh, just uh, to manage the situation of the COVID uh, so that at least the, uh, the farmers are able uh, to continue with the, their agricultural uh, activities, but also to allow for the extension and the agriculture officers actually to continue actually offering uh, the uh, uh, services uh, to the farmers so that at least uh, the agriculture productivity should not really actually be affected as it is being feared. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, this is my last slide. Maybe you can just go to the last slide. Yes, then I'd like to thank you all for listening. I think I'll save some time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Um, Makumba. Um, uh, over to you, Dr. Wanzala. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Makumba, for that great presentation. You've generated quite a few questions, so just be ready. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, we, yeah. Can now move <laughs> we can now move <laughs> on to our next presentation, please. Um, the presenter is Dr. Dixon Correa from Kenya. Dr. Dixon has worked for 10 years as the Agro Inputs Promotion Officer for the National Acceleration Agricultural Input Program, or NAIP, NAIP, and also as the head of the fertilizer unit in the Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock, Fisheries, and Cooperatives for, for Kenya. He is currently posted to the National Value Chain Support Program as a Deputy Project Coordinator. So thank you very much, Mr. Corrier. And uh, let's pull up your presentation. And um, over to you, Kellyan. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Um, I want to thank you for praying uh, for me to get a doctorate. I am not a doctor yet. And uh, I don't have, I've not done a presentation as uh, the way others have done. However, I have a few issues I think I'll summarize, um, which um, of concern to this meeting. Uh, I want to thank uh, my friend, Dr. Rusike, for a very beautiful presentation. And I want to say in Kenya, uh, COVID came in when we, we were lucky in one way because we had enough stocks within the country. Uh, by the time COVID was closing, uh, squeezing life out of countries, we had enough stocks in Kenya. And uh, we were able to manage uh, without a major crisis on uh, fertilizer. Again, um, Yara, Yara, I've had Yara being discussed across the whole uh, continent. They also helped us uh, filling in a few gaps uh, in fertilizer distribution in Kenya. Kenya uh, has been affected by COVID in many ways. And uh, I want to differ a bit with Dr. Rusike because I think COVID came in to disrupt the port. The first cases of uh, COVID in, 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 in Mombasa or in the port. And they really disrupted the, the port operations. A lot of uh, ships were waiting out in the sea for two weeks. And that was a main uh, point, point of contention within the minister and uh, the industry about three weeks ago that we were incurring, uh, the, 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 the ships were incurring a lot of uh, demarrage charges at the port. And that really disrupted uh, most commodities, but I also think fertilizer was involved. Also, there was transportation hitches uh, in terms of um, uh, um, traveling up country, limited time so to, to move, car views. I remember three weeks ago, we had at the border with Uganda, uh, as an example, 40 kilometers of trucks waiting at either side of the border estimated to be about 4,500 trucks, which not only caused a lot of uh, damage and uh, um, uh, losses to trucking companies, but it also deprived the port of, uh, of, uh, of uh, trucks to remove the cargo from the port. So COVID came in and really disrupted um, our, our transport uh, system in Kenya. Um, again, this year, for some reason, not due to COVID, but, uh, the government decided not to buy fertilizers. We didn't procure fertilizers for subsidy. Uh, we now re-engineered the subsidy program. That is what is holding me up in Muguga, as Mr. R Dr. Rusike will tell you later. 
we are trying to operationalize and re-engineer uh, uh, the input, uh, the subsidy program for the country. We are going to use e-voucher and the e-voucher we have registered farmers just for, for others to know, I see Uganda is very similar to ours. We have registered a few farmers to test in 12 counties. We have chosen four value chains, which is maize, uh, Irish potato, uh, coffee and rice. And we have now tested, we have allocated resources to each and uh, the system is mobile based. So we have had a developer to develop the system for us uh, called Safaricom. And we have deposited our money in the bank. So what is going to happen is a, a farmer who is registered will be verified at, at, by a, 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 an extension of SAI in the field. And then they get a, a voucher, an electronic voucher like M-Pesa type voucher. And then they go to the agro dealer, they pay 60% of the cost. And immediately on the spot, the bank tops up with 40%. We have tested the system and we are now making it live. We have made three counties so far today live and the, the agro dealer will receive the money from the bank and release the inputs to the farmer. So that's what we are doing. So for COVID, I don't want to say COVID um, caused a lot of, in the, in the sector, caused a lot of policy changes. However, it disrupted our, our launch of, uh, of the e-voucher and accelerated uh, so many other things, including it accelerated the development of policies. Right now we are developing uh, policies, uh, regulations on uh, fertilizer. The president didn't offer, uh, did offer uh, on in the end of March, he did offer something called eight point plan, post recovery, uh, eight point post COVID recovery plan, which he really did increase some money for the input subsidies through the e-voucher. However, due to the COVID-19, we were not able to, we lost the season. Uh, the long rain season of May, March, May, March, April, May, and we almost lost again this season of October, November. So that is one of the areas. Uh, fertilizer also uh, depends on um, uh, uh, farmers in the in the field. Also depend on other small businesses. Uh, businesses, uh, small businesses closed a lot in Kenya, and it affected the uh, remittances to the families in the rural areas. People usually send their mothers a little money for fertilizer. If you are not uh, earning anything, you, 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 the low purchasing power also spread to the, to the, to the farmers. So basically, that is the situation in Kenya. Also this year, we catered here, as uh, Dr. Rusike did mention, we, we didn't import fertilizer for the small scale tea farmers. And, um, it had the effect of evening out the industry because the industry normally complains that our subsidies disrupt. Even though our subsidies are about 25% of the total consumption, the industry complains a lot that uh, our subsidies uh, disrupt the farmer. That is why we are engineering them. Uh, so this season there was a major, uh, the industry, the, the government subsidies were not there. And it surprised us that the prices of fertilizers who have been generally lower than the, the other years, even though they are rising now, it surprised us that when these industry people are allowed to a level playing ground, they are able to compete and bring down prices. So basically, I'm sorry for not having a structured um, um, presentation like my people. I hope you have gotten uh, my view from Kenya. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Dixon. Um, I think it, it, it was insightful. Uh, a, a lot of questions um, uh, are coming through. And um, I just want to check if um, um, Dr. Moses Mwale is, um, is registered from Zambia. Okay, it seems uh, at the first of the um, webinar he, he was in, um, maybe there are some technical glitches. So he was one of our panelists. Um, over to you, Dr. Wanzal. I think this is the Q&A. Thank you, Killian. So we have quite a few questions in the Q&A. I think I'll just go to them immediately and um, 
I'll uh, spread them out over our panelists. Thank you very much, all, all of the panelists and the keynote presenter for some very interesting presentations. You've generated some, some questions here. The first question, um, I'll try to just uh, read the question as, as they um, have been typed so I don't misrepresent them. Um, the first question is to Dr. Rusike. Do you find that any immediate interventions by central banks or different governments uh, or different arms of government will have any immediate impact to the fertilizer value chain, particularly the forecasting for this coming uh, season in terms of pricing and product availability. Dr. Risike, did you hear my question? Yes, do I answer now or you go through yes, several of them? I answer now? Yeah, and I think that's the key question I have for you at this stage. Okay, can I share the screen again? Yes. And I, I just want to yes, go back go to one slide, which okay. I think answers that question. I'm, I'm going to go. Oh. Um, if, if we read, I'm going to read from left to right, and the responses would go like, did you lay off employees? And we can see for July, uh, across the countries, very little of that happened. Reduced access to trade credit. Again, we've got a little of that. Let's jump to September, which is on the right. Did you lay off employees? We only see Zambia, about 60% of the respondents saying yes. Did you have reduced access to credit? Again, we see some other countries. Uh, let's compare now inflation rate for July and the major affected countries will be Tanzania and Mozambique. And when we turn to inflation rate, interest rate for September, uh, Mozambique is still up there. And um, now what this one does is there's someone, something that is obviously going on um, in terms of linking what's happening with money supply, liquidity, interest rates, and so forth, to how it is affecting the businesses. Uh, particularly when we compare across countries, I would suggest, I would suggest a hypothesis, I would hypothesize that uh, um, uh, there is some effects that are coming from the money supply and so forth, but given the confounding uh, between all these factors, one would have to do a more rigorous analysis to come to the conclusion. But I suggest, yes, the, the policies are, are affecting. How we probably need to set it up, um, in this particular case, we are planning to set it up in a panel data format and tease out and um, um, the confounding factors and try to make some definitive uh, uh, conclusions and actionable insights about what is going on. Thank you, Dr. Rusike. This is actually sort of a follow-up question to that, to your conclusion. Oh, the question okay. reads as follows. If, uh, Dr. Rusike, if I understand well, there has not been a shift in fertilizer or input policies in direct response to COVID. It appears that there has been a continuation of existing subsidies and other programs. Is this correct? Can one no. then conclude that fertilizer subsidies were affected by fiscal, monetary, and trade policies, bearing in mind that COVID-19 hit most parts of Southern Africa after the main summer production season? We, 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 I, think that's, I think we just heard from the Kenyan presentation that they were in the process of restructuring their subsidy program to the e-voucher and mm -hmm. uh, some money, uh, uh, budgets had been increased, allocated to that, but could not be implemented. 
So even when you have got an ongoing fertilizer program, COVID affects how we are implementing it. Yeah. And mm. therefore, the impact it will have. We heard from Dr. Mkumba, Mkumba that in Malawi, they shifted to the affordable input program away from uh, the former farm input support program. Now, uh, COVID did have some influence in that policy shift and the way it is being implemented. We will trace and see whether it is going to affect or not. Then all these other programs recall when Yara comes in, when ETG comes in, when others come in, they also affect what the government does or the government doesn't do. Because these programs were targeting in, in response to COVID and most likely vulnerable households, they did affect even the ongoing government programs. Yeah. We could, that could have been shown by the Zambian uh, presentation uh, 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 as well. What one acre fund is, there is doing, what FAP um, is also doing in that country. Again, they, they do affect. So it's not true to say that because government has put an ongoing program, it wasn't affected by COVID. Indirectly, it was affected, or it was yeah. reshaped, or it was redesigned, restructured, re-engineered, retrofitted. Yeah. OK. Thank you very much, Dr. Risike. All right, I think we now have a series of questions for Dr. Makumba with regards to the uh, fertilizer subsidy program in Malawi. Um, I think I'll just pose the questions and you can answer as you see fit. The questions are yeah. as follows. Um, what type of fertilizers are given um, as an MPK or other types of fertilizers? Um, what about seeds? Um, how many, uh, you mentioned 100 metric tons of seeds, but for how many farmers? How many farmers are you targeting with the, with the seeds? And then there's a question about why um, is the subsidy program giving out hybrid seeds um, as opposed to OPVs, which can be uh, open pollinative varieties, which can be used in the following year. So I think that those are the main questions. And the same questions actually um, are for Kenya. Um, and then for Kenya, in, in addition to the question about why hybrids are no OPVs, um, if you can briefly explain how the e-voucher system is going to work. Okay. So those uh, are the questions for Malawi and for Kenya. Very similar question. Okay. Yes, yeah, go thanks ahead. Thanks very please. much. Uh, the first question, what type of fertilizer is given to the farmers? Uh, for the NPK, we have 23, 10, 5, uh plus one zinc plus a uh, six s uh that is 50 kg back that is given to each uh, family and the uh, for top dressing we have a urea uh, for the six percent n that is given to uh cherry as a pack uh with the npk uh for the fat light for the seeds the 100 metric tons, actually, this is what Bayer has donated to Malawi, uh, to the farmers. Uh, but uh, the farmers that are receiving, actually, that are eligible to get the uh, agriculture uh, affordable input, uh, uh, who are in the affordable input actually program, they have got actually in their voucher uh, seed that they can buy. So this is different from the 100 metric ton that the Bayer has actually donated to the farmers. Uh, the type of seeds that the farmers are able to access with their vouchers, uh, we have the hybrid seed. Uh, there is a OPV. There is a uh, rice. There's sorghum. Uh, for the seed that uh, Bayer has donated, 
actually this is what actually Bayer is producing. So Bayer is producing hybrid seed only, not OPV. So they are able to give out what they are producing actually to the farmers. But those farmers that are actually are able to buy the seed using actually the e vouchers under the AIP, that is the uh, affordable input program, then they have got that uh, choice either to go for the hybrid seed or they can go for the OPV uh, for the men. If they say no, we won't like actually to uh, grow sorghum, then they can actually uh, use that voucher to buy uh, sorghum. Those that want to produce a seed, I uh, mean uh, rice, then they can buy using the same voucher, uh, they can buy uh, rice seed. So it's a choice. I think those were the three questions. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Makumba. Um, we have a similar question for Kenya. Um, why hybrids and no OPV seeds given? And then how does the e voucher system work? Those are the questions for Kenya. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. In Kenya, we were trying to run this thing uh, uh, informed by science. Uh, in the beginning, we did try to put the soil testing uh, subsidy on the e-voucher itself so that farmers could test for uh, to their soils and come up with the, the right fertilizers. However, when we tried to operationalize it, we thought that it was not possible to uh, get a unique fertilizer for each farm. So we have changed and said the money will be used to do within the sub counties general uh, soil testing for the whole place and then we get a rule of thumb it says zinc is missing here and um, zinc is a, or the sulfur is missing in the soil and then we get a blend which will fit into that uh, uh, system that will be next season so this year we are trying to 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 use um, all the available fertilizers, uh, the farmers uh, make a choice. There is a drop down of fertilizers, for example, for maize, you will find DAP because some farmers are bewitched with it. But there are also so many other blends from uh, different companies which have come up in the last five years. So you have uh, one blend called Baraka. We don't like promoting it, so we put in the formula like uh, 20, 20 22, 6, 12 plus S. We don't want to look like the government is promoting uh, some brands. It brings a lot of war between the companies. So we are trying to get informed by science. For seed, the use of hybrid seed in high potential areas of Kenya is uh, long uh, done. And if you bring their OPVs, the farmers will not take. OPVs are used in the drier parts of Kenya, southeastern and the coast. When we reach there, when in the next round, uh, we will try to see whether OPVs will go. But OPVs in Kenya are used in marginal areas. The hybrid farmers, they are so well informed that sometimes uh, the agricultural staff have to catch up with them. So the OPV, hybrid use in Kenya is, um, is very much in, common in the high potential areas. I think also Kenya is one of the largest seed uh, certified seed users of base in Africa after, I don't know, South Africa. So that is how it is. The e-subsidy uh, in Kenya was re-engineered because the previous subsidy, we were not able to trace, we were not able to trace uh, who took the fertilizer. And when some people did some uh, analysis, they said, okay, you've been giving uh, subsidies since 2008, worth 37 billion shillings. The, the, the production of maize has not significantly increased. So what we have done is to re-engineer it so that we know who takes what when. So that every day when farmers redeem, we know these agro dealers sold 25,000, no, not thousand, uh, 200 bags of DAP. He sold uh, um, 500 bags of this blend of fertilizer for maize and we can know who took it. And we have his GPS number within the system. And if we wanted to go as an audit query, we can actually visit that farm and we have his photograph. So the new one is we have engineered it so that we, 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 we register farmers, all of them. 
in the areas we want to do. We have tested in 12 counties. Continuous registration is ongoing for the rest of the country. And we have put in a platform, a new platform. And we have removed our money from uh, the government exchequer and put it in a bank. Usually government exchequer uh, uh, is uh, very inefficient in dispersing money real time. So we have put our money in a bank. We have an e-platform. We have registered farmers. Every time a farmer wants to, 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 to buy fertilizer in the new system, he goes to the ward officer who will check him that, oh, what do you want? Do you need, uh, you have five acres of land? Do you need for three acres or you need for two? Then they'll agree. Then they'll also get an advice on the best fertilizer. And then that farmer is the wow or the word agricultural officer will trigger the issuance of an e-voucher to that farmer. And then the farmer goes direct to the agro dealer nearest. We are trying to put as many agro dealers as possible. We are thinking the best maximum of three kilometers would be ideal, but when we really tested it, it is very difficult to achieve in some areas. We are seeking a farmer not to move less than three kilometers, goes to the agro dealer. The agro dealer inputs the voucher into his uh, system, and then uh, they, they trigger something called a STK push. The farmer is told you are buying two bags of fertilizer. Therefore, the amount of 60% is this amount. It comes. Then they pay by M-Pesa. M-Pesa is running this thing. And then as soon as the, the farmer pays the 60%, then the, the, the bank will deposit in real time, as in less than two minutes, the 40% from government. And uh, 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 the agro dealer is informed that your 100% your has been deposited in your uh, M-Pesa till or bank account. And then they release the fertilizer. So that is basically uh, how it works. And um, of course, sometimes um, glitches come up here and there, but there are very few. So that is how the e-voucher system in Kenya uh, runs. I hope uh, I've been understood. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Corey. Very clear um, answer there. Thank you. We now have a question I'd like to, do, to direct to all the members of the panel, as well as the keynote, if you would like to comment. It's around the issue of organic fertilizer. There are two, um, two attendees who have posed this, this kind of question. The first question is, we are an organic fertilizer manufacturer, and we blend our organics with inorganic fertilizers to make blended fertilizers. And we also have straight organics. I have two observations here. First, the exceptionally high MPK fertilizers being prescribed for the production of crops. It is common knowledge that chemical fertilizers are damaging the soil and the environment. Most of these inputs are lost due to volatilization or being unavailable for plant intake. So we, uh, we go for significantly lower MPK fertilizers and we add our own organics and biologicals. Secondly, why are countries not using their own natural organic resources to import, substitute, and save valuable foreign currency? The world is moving away from chemical fertilizers, but Africa continues to be inundated with MPKs. And then in a related question, Africa is a very young and growing population. So if we wish to grow a healthy African future, we have to feed the soil to feed the planet. Iron and zinc are being used to fortify staple foods, but there are no minor or micronutrients in our fertilizers. So how are, we, how are we going to grow nutritious food? So the issue basically is, what about organic fertilizers? Why are they not on the table? Why uh, is the focus on the use of chemical fertilizers? I'd like to start with Uganda because Uganda has a history of actually, or I should say has a younger history of using chemical fertilizers. And then it would be great to hear responses from the other panelists. Thank you. Ms. Nakanwagi, are you on the line? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. I All right. I'm not sure if um, Ms. Nakanwagi is with us. Maybe um, one of the other panelists can begin with a response then if they're ready. Yeah, I can contribute. Are you able to hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Can I go ahead or? 
Malawi. <laughs> no, go ahead. Okay. Yes, sir. So, uh, just to, to respond to that uh, about organics, uh, I want to say that uh, for Africa, we have the lowest, like she has said, and Uganda has the lowest among us, uh, the many. And the, the use of organics is ongoing. And uh, uh, one of the observations is that the organics are really are never enough because you need about five tons per hectare of organics to be able to meet the nutrient demands. For example, if you want to, to supply enough N to the crop, so one of the issues with organics is availability. However, as a, a project, as, as a project, we 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 it's an ongoing process to bring in people who can supply organics for our farmers. But the issue is availability. We see we see it as a, having a lot of, for example, materials that we can use to process the organics, but we are not yet there. If you look around and assess uh, the availability of organics, they are not enough at all for our farmers, given the high quantities of organics that we need to, to, to give to our, our crops. Yeah, thank you. I can come in. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, actually, first of all, let me agree with the, the previous speaker. Uh, usually the recommendations that we have uh, for the organic uh, materials, they are so huge. As such, most of the smallholder farmers, they cannot actually uh, attain such quantities. And indeed, they, they are bucky, of which when he has, if he is to transport actually like the farmyard manure, uh, to where they have their pieces of uh, uh, land. Indeed, it will be also expensive, on the other hand, because of the transport costs. However, we have agroforestry that we have introduced, which is also working. But the only problem is that it's also long term. It does not give a dramatic solution within the same year. One has to wait for uh, patiently. Uh, most of the agroforestry, at least they've got uh, two to three years of actually waiting before you get uh, good results. Uh, the best uh, approach is that uh, we really need to have a combination of the uh, organic and inorganic. Uh, in most cases, the organic materials that we have, actually uh, they range between two to four percent of nitrogen that's why we need to large, have large quantities of the organic materials applied uh, to get uh, a similar uh, quantity of uh, organic, actually nitrogen uh, inputted in the, into the soil uh, for the crop. So it is advisable that the, in these cases, as we are building up the nutrient capital through the application of the organic materials, we still have to add the uh, inorganic fertilizer. By and by, of course, the uh, research has shown that uh, after four, five uh, to six years, you can reduce the use of inorganic fertilizer by 50%. So I think that is a big achievement and could assist the farmers, of course, to reduce the uh, dependency on the inorganic fertilizer. In Malawi, we have gone as far as the actually encouraging farmers to produce the uh, compost manure, uh, which as well could be actually produced right in the field. Uh, but of course, the, uh, it is of course the tedious, laborious, you know, as compared the, uh, to the bag of fertilizer that it can take actually uh, a large uh, acreage as compared to uh, actually uh, to the inorganic fertilizer uh, to uh, attain the similar uh, proportions. The other question, of course, is saying that uh, in our fertilizers, we do not have uh, uh, actually micronutrients. I think that is not really very correct because uh, the one that I just uh, actually mentioned, which we are using as our NPK, uh, unfortunately, we're just saying NPK. 
but it extends to uh, zinc and sulfur. So in Malawi, you know, after we had the map, there was always, we indeed actually had noticed that we are lacking micronutrients of where we have already started. We ascribed the one fertilizer, uh, which we recommended, a compound fertilizer, which is the uh, 23 percent nitrogen, uh, 10 percent uh, phosphorus, uh, and 5 percent potassium, then the uh, 1 percent zinc, and the 6 percent sulfur. Uh, previously, when we are saying we have we are applying NPK, it was the 23 percent nitrogen, 21 percent phosphorus and there was the, no uh, potassium, there was no zinc. Uh, only had the 4% uh, uh, sulfur in that com uh, combination. But this one has since been banned and has been replaced uh, with the one that I've just mentioned, which has got the uh, potassium, uh, just to replenish the potassium that has been exhausted actually, overmined in the soil, but also uh, zinc that we actually found that uh, of course the uh, uh, it's, uh, it has gone to 46% of uh, actually deficiency across the country. Uh, we have done, of course, uh, lately again, the soil mapping uh, that has shown other nutrients that, uh, of course, are deficient, the micronutrients are deficient in the soils. And uh, we are working with the, uh, the blending companies in the country uh, to come up with the new uh, formulations that includes the, those the, that that those the, uh, nutrients, so that we recommend into those areas that are deficient. So this time we are moving from uh, one fertilizer recommendation across the country to area-specific fertilizer recommendation. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Mkumba. Mkumba. Um, any contribution from Kenya or from the keynote? Presenter? All right. Okay. Oh, go ahead, please. Okay. I just want to uh, organics are very key in production in Africa, but is as Uganda said it correctly, is a bulky thing. And uh, the farmers we are dealing with are not able to accumulate this in sufficient quantity quantities uh, to give us the green revolution as happened Asia. However, we have tried. I think uh, in Kenya, soils are really lacking in organic matter. These farms have been farmed for, since the 1920s by large uh, white people. They went and the soil is really poor sometimes. So the issue is bulk. The second one is consistency. Even in uh, manufactured uh, organics, it is very difficult to maintain consistency uh, considering what you used to make, the ingredients used to make these things. Then also, diseases. I see people go to my island, buy a lot of uh, a lot of organic uh, farmyard manure. They sometimes come with weeds. They sometimes even come with diseases sometimes. So it is it is a good thing, but we really need to work at it in the scientific community to see how we can... Uh, got over these challenges. The other issue on um, on uh, supplements, or um, not supplements, on the micronutrients, I think in Kenya somehow we are, we are lucky because very many farmers are now conscious of this use. We are manufacturing about 43 supplements, uh, sub balanced fertilizer, if you may call it, blended fertilizer with zinc, with um, sulfur, with boron, depending on the needs, especially for tea, maize, coffee, and some other crops. We have had, uh, from five years ago, we had two blenders uh, with about 300,000 metric ton capa installed capacity. Now we are having four blenders and another one coming up in Akuru, uh, which have an installed capacity of 1.3 million metric tons. So they, they, it is catching up. We could, we could do more, but I think we are in the right direction in terms of uh, balanced foods for Africa and for Kenya, at least, in terms of balanced fertilizers. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Correa. Okay. <clears throat> Is there any uh, last burning questions? We're coming to the end of our session. Um, are there any burning questions from any, anybody in the uh, in the audience? If not, I think we can wrap up. So I want to say thank you very much to everybody for participating. I think the the general um, message we can come away with is that governments in Africa have broadly responded to the COVID-19 crisis, but the policy responses have not yet really targeted the fertilizer market. Rather, we've seen a continuation or a deepening of existing policies, particularly subsidy policy. But as Dr. Isike, our keynote speaker, has cautioned, it's early days, and now is the time really to collect data so that when sufficient time has passed, we can do some meaningful analysis, look at the impact of um, policies on agricultural productivity, and then develop some appropriate policy recommendations. So that is my main takeaway. And uh, with that, unless there's some burning questions from the audience Hi. or unless one of the keynote speak one of the presenters or keynote speaker would like to add um, or make a a, a, a parting um, comment. I think I'd like to say thank you very much and wish all of you an enjoyable day further. Killian, over to you. Okay, thank you. Um very much for participating in our webinar. Um, we will be sharing the presentations or the presentations with the participants um, in the, um, during the course of the week. Um, thank you once again. Uh, and we hope you will join our future webinars. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good day. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.